and this is 337 and 3371 welding and joining and fabrication technology. Uh, I'm happy to see as many people here this time. I haven't taught this course for three years. Uh, but uh, let me explain a few things about it. First of all, I had 15 handouts this morning because I didn't know how many people and that's how much fits in one of these boxes. We'll have more for you tomorrow um, for those of you who didn't get them. There's no reading assignment tonight you have to worry about uh, as far as that goes. If you want to pick them up between now and, and uh, tomorrow or whatever, my secretary is Jerry Hill and she's in 4134. So you can stop by downstairs and her number is 85793. Um, but we can bring some more up next time. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the course and how it evolved. Um, it started out 16 years ago as a course on science of welding and joining. Sometime around 1989, when the Leaders from Manufacturing program started, I kind of modified it some to make it a little bit uh, more manufacturing oriented. And then when Professor Masabuchi over in Ocean Engineering retired, there are certain things that the people in the Naval Construction Engineering program have to have. I specifically avoided those when he was teaching his course, but when he retired, uh, Professor uh, Chrysostomides asked me to to add those subjects into this course. And the way I did it is essentially added three units and made it 3371 fabrication technology. Um, the other thing is, why does it meet um, at 7.30 in the morning? Well, it meets at 7.30 in the morning because there are typically three groups of students who take this. One is those students in 13B, no, 13A, 13A. In fact, these are J courses and they have a course 13 number. Does anybody remember what they are? 13 number? 391? So that's 13, 391, J. And I don't remember, that's got a, a, a course 13 number as well, I think. But it doesn't matter. So you can sign up for either one, it doesn't matter. Um, how many of you are in 13A? Okay, so roughly half of you. Um, any of you in straight 13? Okay. Sometimes we pick up a real name one thing, um, as opposed to a to start it. Uh, how many people are in LFM? Okay, so that's usually most of the rest. And then there's a third group, which are people from anywhere else. Any of those in here? Okay, actually we've got five of, five over here, so. And that's kind of a typical breakdown. Now, why is it being videotaped? Because about 1990 or 91, uh, this was the first course that MIT ever offered credit at a distance. Okay, we, we did an experiment, and this was the first course. Uh, it meets at 7.30 in the morning in part because um, it has students from a number of different departments. I didn't ask the other students which departments they're from, but I've had students from most of the engineering departments, a couple of the science departments, and Sloan School of Management actually take this course. So, um, there is no time. I went to the study in that semester, the only time that in the regular nine to five, it wasn't already taken, was four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. It didn't conflict with someone's schedule. So I started teaching at eight o'clock in the morning, and then about eight years ago, Sloan switched to 8.30 classes, so we pushed back to 7.30, and the deal I made at that time with the students, I'll provide breakfast for you at seven o'clock if you'll come to class at 7.30, okay? And we will be done. I will usually start within a minute of that time, and we will finish at 8.20, which is your 50 minute class. So those of you who do have to get over to Sloan to take your 8.30 Sloan classes can get over there, okay? We will then have a little bit of a break and those that are taking fabrication technology will do a half hour class. We, I've handed out a class schedule, which is nothing more than the MIT calendar. Um, it only goes September and October because the other thing is, um, during the 1990s, I was an administrator at MIT. I'm no longer an administrator. I saw the light, but anyway. Um, 
And because of my schedule um, and travel and whatnot, I found it easier, and the students actually, I think, like it, the graduate students, I wouldn't do this for an undergraduate course, to just teach every day I'm in town. And we finish by Halloween, okay? And that means that you don't have to worry about this course when all the other courses are starting to give you the crunch. The other thing I found is once we hit daylight savings, we go off daylight savings time, it's a lot harder for you to get in here. Okay? <laughs> so, because you're coming in in the dark, so far as that goes. Uh, we're videotaping it this year, even though, oh, um, even though we don't have distance students, because where I learned from videotaping it was if you miss a class, you can watch the movie. You can make it up. And in fact, this year, Chris Musso and Jin Woo Park uh, are going to work on videotaping it and putting it on the web with MIT's Open Courseware, this, this thing they claim that they're doing for the world. And they say there's $100 million, of which no one's ever seen a dime yet. Okay? Um, and that, that everyone can take an MIT class. Well, um, as one faculty member said, we'll have institutionalized mediocrity on the web. Um, because basically, if you just put the course notes on the web, what is that? So I've decided to go one better. I'm actually going to put the lectures on the, on the web. And anybody who wants to can take an MIT course. They won't get credit from MIT, but they can take the course. Uh, but it, what it also does is it helps you to be able to make up classes if you miss one. It also makes it possible, if you see this course listed in the catalog, you'll see it's listed every semester. And I realized when I had these students in General Motors taking the course, why couldn't MIT students take it every term? Because you're going to find that this is course is such that you don't have to do anything except watch the movie or come to class. And your advantage of coming to class is you get a free breakfast. But you could watch the movie. There are two or three LFM students off-site taking this course this semester by video. Okay, so there's a few other students. And typically other semesters, there are four or five students who take it off-site. There's not a lot of work to the course uh, from your point of view. In fact, the first page of the handout, not all of you have it, but it's some quotes from a few years ago from the student evaluations. And it basically says um, things like, well, what does it say? Um, you can make the course as in-depth as you want. The, the requirement for the course, MIT says that I have to require something of you. And so you can either do a 10-page problem set, or you can do a 10-page not 10 page, but 10 problem problem set, or a 10 page term paper. And I don't want a term paper that's any longer than 10 pages because I have to read it uh, if it's longer than that. Um, you should spend about 10 hours on that problem set or that term paper, not any more than that. Uh, it's, uh, if you want to do a term paper, you should schedule a time to come see me. We can spend 15 minutes and you can tell me what you want to do, and I'll give you some, some guidance on what to go read and, and stuff. Term papers are usually done by people who want to learn something more about something. For example, how many of you are surface ships? Okay. I just happen to be on the HSLA 65 committee. So you want to read two notebooks for, for the, what the Navy's doing? Anybody know what HSLA 65 is? They don't even tell you the name. This is a higher strength deal for uh, surface ships that they're trying to qualify for the CBA. NX, for those of you that are not Navy, that's the next generation aircraft carrier. They decided that they couldn't afford to design a whole new hull, so they're going to go with the Nimitz class hull. But in order to do that, they have to lighten the ship. Because the aircraft carrier gains 100 tons a year. You plot its weight over time. And it tends to gain it up top, which makes it sort of unstable. That's not good. Um, don't like flipping over in the seas. Um, and so, in order to lighten the ship, they got to take a couple of thousand tons out to extend the life of about 20 years of this particular hull design. And to do that, they're going to uh, qualify a steel that's about 33% stronger than the current class of steel that's been used for 50 years, uh, as far as that goes. So, if anybody wants to study that and do a term paper on that, you can study these two notebooks and see what the Navy's been doing and things like that. Uh, for example, if you're in the Navy, if you're in an LFM program, I had a student once from Alcoa, 
he wanted to understand how beer cans were made, or soda cans, saying whether you're teetotal or not. Um, and so, turns out there's not a lot of literature. He went back to Alcoa, he went to the patent literature, and there's a lot of joining technology and forming technology just to put the little tab on there and to seal the top and stuff. He actually spent a lot more time than he should have, but I think it was a publishing paper when it was all done, uh, because there wasn't much out there on it. But anyway, you'll see lots of quotes on here. You really have to decide what you want to make out of this course. If you just come to class and listen, you'll, you'll see from these quotes, there's lots of fun stories, and that's what the students always like. Um, one of them did point out here, um, you can learn as much from his stories and digressions as you can from the prepared lectures. Uh, that assumes there are prepared lectures. Um, but, in fact, um, please do ask questions as we go along. Um, some students have always been amazed. I have a, have a, digression, I have a story for every digression. Um, we'll see if I can come up with a story yeah, for each of your digressions. But you actually can learn a lot from the digressions. And I'm, I'm not wedded to a particular thing that we have to go through every day. Because, in fact, the whole purpose of the course, from my point of view, is not to teach you welding and joining. Um, in some ways, welding and joining is not of that much interest to me. It was a way for me to get tenure at MIT, because you have to have something you're an expert in. And so, uh, you know, one person told me early on, get into a backward field, it's not hard to be a star. And so I picked welding and joining because there's not a lot of science to it, um, or there hasn't been. Well, but the real thing is, how do you think about problems? If anything I ever learned at MIT is, how to think about problems. And welding and joining is nice because it integrates a lot of what you learned before. It's not a field. Um, it's not a discipline. It basically is an application of science and technology, usually technology before the science. Um, in fact, I often say that welding and joining is so important that almost any time anyone discovers a new power source, one of its first applications is to try to use it to weld. When Sir Humphrey Davy in 1807 or whatever it was, discovered the electric arc, one of the first things he did was try to make a weld with it. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1880s or 70s when people started getting electrical generators, that electrical arc welding became prominent, but that was only because they didn't have sources of, of high current electricity before that. One of the first applications of lasers, lasers were invented basically in the, in the uh, 50s, and in the 50s and early 60s, General Electric was repairing vacuum tubes. Most of you haven't even seen a vacuum tube. But back in the old days, before semiconductors, we had vacuum tubes. And the problem with vacuum tubes is you had to make a, a spot weld between a couple pieces of tungsten or some other refractory metal in there. And sometimes they'd make this $100 vacuum tube, which back in 1960, $100 was a lot of money. Um, and, and they'd find that one of the joints had come loose. And, they, uh, and so you didn't have the connection, and you're going to have to cut this thing open, and you know, it's an expensive piece of equipment to repair it. And they found with the laser, they could go in there and hit one of the things with a low pulse and weaken it, and by gravity have it fall over and touch the other one. Then they could go in with the laser with a higher power and weld it back together without ever breaking the vacuum seal. Okay, just shooting the laser through the glass. That was an early application. One of the, uh, some of the early applications of electron beams were to do welding. Uh, I can tell you that some of the earliest applications of particle beam weapons was to see if you could weld things together. Turns out particle beam weapons are not so useful for welding, mostly because if you want to weld something, you usually just want to weld a little bit of something, like the seam between two solids. And you really only need about anywhere from 40 to 100 kilowatts to do that. The problem with particle beam weapons, they put up about 5 megawatts, and so you can melt the whole thing, which is not too interesting a joint, but nonetheless. Um, so welding is a very practical field. It integrates physics, chemistry, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, metallurgy, uh, all kinds of other materials uh, into one field. Um, you're not going to, none of you are going to follow all the topics that I talk about because one day I might be talking about something that's electrical and I'll try to keep it 
at kind of an undergraduate level. Um, another day I'll be talking about something that might be structural. Um, you should just try to get a feel for it and a feel for the field of engineering across all of these things. What I would really like you to learn is you actually have enough basic physics and chemistry from your undergraduate education to put these things together. You just don't know how yet. Um, the world is not really complex. Uh, if people make it more complex than it really is. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it, some of the digressions and stories just have to do with uh, human relations and how you treat people. Uh, if you go out in the manufacturing world, you find that, I always tell students, 90% of the problems are people problems and only 10% of the problems are technology problems. So a lot of the stories actually have kind of a, um, uh, some sort of message that way in terms of how do you get along with people or how do you communicate and things like that. Because, in fact, if you talk to people who graduated from MIT and say, what is it you didn't learn at MIT that you needed to know, most of them will come back and say, I needed to learn how to communicate better or I needed to learn how to deal with people better uh, than when we uh, taught at MIT. That's not to say that MIT doesn't try to teach those things, it's just uh, or that any other school necessarily does a better job. It's just because we're engineers, we get maligned for it more than anybody else. Uh, so any questions? <laughs> now, because of my travel schedule, we have this sheet. Um, there, and it turns out I'm traveling the next two days. But there will be class tomorrow, but not Friday. So you can cross off the 7th. Tomorrow, you're going to get to come here and see two videos. One is a 1980 video made by the Japan uh, Welding Research Institute on what happens in high energy density beam welding and cutting. And it, it won, a, won a prize uh, in uh, 1980. It has a nice British narration. The Japanese love British accents. Um, but uh, So it has a nice British narration. And they do such things as laser weld on Pyrex glass so, and do high-speed photography so you can see the fluid flow in a laser weld pool. They uh, use an x-ray camera to look at a uh, laser welding or electron beam welding on aluminum. And if you look carefully at that part, it doesn't explain it, but there's a little dark spot in the aluminum that the, the, the deep penetration weld is moving towards. And when it hits that dark spot, it turns out dark, dark spot, they just drilled a hole and put a little piece of copper in there. And so copper being more x-ray dense than the aluminum, when it hits the copper, you can see the fluid flow within the pool on the x-ray camera. Uh, so you'll see as it hits this little pill of copper, you'll see the dark swirls as the, the copper mixes with the aluminum. Okay. Uh, so far as I know, next week I'm here every day. Um, after that, um, Actually, I think I'm here. Well, I'm, I know I'm not here on the 19th and 20th. However, um, there's about three days worth of videos to watch, or maybe even four. But there's also the possibility of taking a lab tour. Students wanted to go on lab tours in the past to see plasma art cutting or resistance spot welding or different welding processes or cutting processes. How many people want lab tours this year? OK, so we'll probably split it up. You're too big a group. We'll have half of you do one day, and it'll only be a 45 minute lab tour, um, and half of you do another day, okay, uh, on the 19th and the 20th. Uh, so far as I know, in September, it's the next two days, the 19th and 20th, of the, did I say 19th and 20th? Uh, yeah, 19th and 20th. Um, are the only days that I know that I'm gone right now, um, and we'll actually fill those in. The class, there's 25 days of lecture, and then there's four or five days of of this other stuff. If you look at all the, if you counted up all the days on here, we got, I've got something like 33 days, and I just canceled the seventh, so we're down to 32. So um, we will run up towards October, and I still may miss another one. Uh, we'll see how things go. Okay. Any questions on organization? So you got to do whatever you want for. Uh, to, oh, on homework sets. If you decide to do the problems, if you do a, a term paper, I've never had. Two people collaborate on term paper before, but I guess you could. Uh, on the homework sets, um, there's 10 problems. The 10 problems for those of you that already have the handouts. Um, and by the way, the second page of the handout, I noticed just now, this morning, 
is my, it kind of gives you the mechanics. It gives you the old schedule from 1999. It had my old room number when I was department head. You can forget that. And there's the one on the board. Um, the next one is just kind of a syllabus, tells you what we're going over. The next one is a bibliography, a couple bibliographies. The next one, actually, the handouts, you know, there's this inch thick handout here, which is, if you want to read everything in the course, you can. The one thing that I would suggest that you read is chapter 16. Um, chapter 16 is something I wrote about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, by taking the lecture notes from this course and going home one day and just spending the whole day and writing this chapter based on the outline of this course. Uh, what happened is a professor in another department was writing a book on manufacturing, and actually may have been even longer ago than that, but he basically uh, had gotten some money to write this two volume book, set of books on manufacturing, and he gave out, he, he got other professors in his department to say, okay, I'll write a chapter on this and I'll write a chapter on that. And apparently the guy who, and they gave him a $500 advance for writing the chapter. And uh, the guy, the young professor who was supposed to write, write the welding chapter didn't get tenure or left or something. And so I got this kind of emergency request by another professor, would I write the welding chapter? Well, I wrote the welding chapter. It wasn't until six months later I found out everybody else had gotten a $500 advance. I got nothing. Uh, and then I went to the more senior guy who uh, I said, of course, I had, turns out I was the only person other than the senior guy who had tenure in this whole process. Uh, I said, where's my 500 bucks? Oh, well, the other guy already skipped town with it. Oh, oh thanks. So I, anyway, so I wrote this chapter. Then they had some meetings and they decided that they would divide the royalties of this book up on based on how, how many pages you wrote. I had the shortest chapter. <laughs> okay. It went out for review, and the only chapter that got a good review was mine. Okay, uh, The others were all too lengthy and verbose and all this other stuff. Um, anyway, uh, the book never went anywhere. I never got a dime off this. But in fact, um, this is a textual outline of the course. If you want to know what's in this course, you can read this. It won't have all the digressions and all the other neat things. But uh, the other thing is at the back of this are the 10 problems. Here's your problem set. Starting on page 16-29, except it doesn't have a page number. There are 10 problems, one of which was, does not have a viable solution. These problems, some of them, three or four of them are just like your old undergraduate problems. You know, you plug and chug and you get a number and everybody gets the same number. But the majority of them are problems that are open-ended. They may, give, may not give you enough information, they may give you too much information. And that really confuses the students, because you've all learned over the years that you read the problem and you have to use all the pieces to solve the problem. And if you didn't use one of the pieces, oops, you must have done the problem wrong, right? Uh, because you have to use all the pieces. And it's even worse if the professor left a piece of information out and you had to go to the library and look for it. Well, what would you do? You know, I mean, you can't, that's not the way problems are done. Well, in the real world, your, your boss doesn't come to you and say, you know, I happen to know that you worked on finite element analysis, so I'm going to give you this finite element analysis problem. He's going to come to you and say, I got an accounting problem over here, I want you to solve it. And you say, I don't know anything about accounting. He says, I don't care, I want you to solve it. Uh, so you have to, the, the problems are um, a little bit more open-ended. Uh, many of them do not have a unique solution, and after looking at the answers for 10 years, I can tell you they do not have a unique solution. Some of them, I don't know what the solution is now that I've read so many solutions. Um, uh, but it's okay to get together as a group and divvy up the problems and turn in a group problem set. I once had 19 LFM students turn in one problem set. Uh, that means I have to grade less. However, if you do that, you have to, on, uh, kind of on your honor, promise that you will get together as a group. I don't care if it's a group of two or five or 19, and you will discuss the problem <coughs> so that every student knows what the problem is and what the pieces of the problem are and why you attacked it the way you attacked it. That's a better learning process than each of you doing it individually and beating your head against the wall. So I, I'm, I'm happy with time sharing on problems. Okay, it's more efficient for me. 
I think is a better learning experience for you. It's not necessarily easier for you unless you do get a big group, okay? And I mean, 19, they didn't even all have to work the problems, right? Uh, and if you're really clever, you'll go and find some student that took the class in the past and just steal their problem set. I'm not opposed to that, as long as you sit down and understand it. That's how I got through this place, okay? I had, a, I had the Bibles from, a, uh, from another student, and he was a great student. And I would go and look at his solutions, and I would spend the time making sure that I understood his solutions. Now, if you don't understand, if you, if you just kind of copy something down, and just turn it in, and you haven't stopped to figure out why they did it, then you're cheating yourself. You're not cheating me. Um, it really doesn't matter. In this course, I used to be able to say, no one has to take this course. Unfortunately, now some of the 13 A's have to take this course. But before, when, before Professor Masabuchi retired, there was no one in the institute who had to take this course. And I still could get 30 or 40 students a year um, taking the course. Um, so. We're here to learn. It's not an undergraduate course. I don't really have to grade you. Um, I can tell you there's only been one grade ever given, actually two grades given in this course, pass or A, in 15 years, um, or incomplete. I've given incompletes. Um, if you don't turn in the problem set or you don't turn in a uh, term paper, you can get an incomplete. Um, I did send around a sign-up sheet, so please sign up if you're gonna register for the course. Um, for 3371, in the next hour, I will pass around another sign-up sheet. I might be redundant to sign up on that one again. The difference between the two courses is basically 3371 includes all of 337, but it adds this extra half hour. In this extra half hour, I cover material selection, fracture mechanics, non-destructive testing, and welding metallurgy. Uh, so those were some of the, well, certainly welding metallurgy and maybe material selection, were two of the things that Professor Masaluchi used to teach. I decided that I ought to teach, if you're trying to build these great big structures, you should uh, also learn something about non-destructive testing, and you ought to learn something about fracture mechanics. Now, some of you, how many of you have already had fracture mechanics in some course? A few of you, okay? Well, I'll tell you how to do it simple. That's the other thing in this course. Um, uh, I don't care for solving partial differential equations. We will solve one in this class, just so I can prove that I'm an MIT faculty member. <laughs> but, um, I try, I've always, I'm sort of a, uh, a person who goes against the grain of whatever the grain is. I'm a contrarian. Because MIT teaches things, most people teach in the, you know, got to get very analytical and you got to work out this equation and that equation. Um, I tend to try to keep it, I try to do the opposite. If MIT was doing teaching all the other courses like I teach this one, then I'd be out solving differential equations to show you how to do the other, the other side of things. So I basically am trying to teach things different than the typical MIT approach. In fact, I think that was one of the uh, students' comments. It's very practical and refreshing for an MIT course or something. Um, but that's, that's not because I think that's the only way to teach. It's because I'm just trying to teach differently than my colleagues, uh, just to be contrary. Okay, any any questions? It's kind of a long introduction, but let's. Uh, one question. Okay, why bother to study welding and joining? Well, for me, I got tenure. That's the first reason. Um, and you know what tenure means? You might know what tenure means. Tenure means never having to say you're sorry. Except most of you haven't seen that movie. There was a story a movie called Love Story once. And the big phrase out of that was never having to say you're sorry. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Tenure also means you can say whatever you want to your boss and you don't have to say you're sorry afterwards. Um, tenure also means never having to write the first draft. And my graduate students will attest to that. Uh, I don't write first drafts so much anymore. Um, one, why study welding? Well, to me, there's a certain excitement to it. I'm going to be excited about welding. Well, it's got me tenure, so that's pretty exciting. Um, but it does, I already said, it combines virtually everything you know. It's integrative. And one of the problems we have 
at MIT is we tend to, in most of our courses, be very deductive rather than inductive about what we do. In fact, I was on a chair of committee a few years ago uh, that eventually the Engineering Systems Division was a recommendation that came out of that committee. But I did a survey of all the department heads and center directors at MIT and said, how many of your faculty, or what percentage of your faculty's time is being spent on integrative aspects of engineering? And how much is being spent on you know, the more deductive analytical parts? And the answer came back, if you average everything, and it's a pretty gross average, about 15% of the faculty time was spent on the integrative aspects of engineering. And then the next question was, how much should be spent? And these leaders here basically said, about 30%. So MIT faculty only spent about half as so much time worrying about the bigger issues uh, and how everything fits together than they do on the analytical things. Um, so you, you can study thermochemistry, arc physics, uh, kinetics, structure mechanics, fracture mechanics, uh, virtually all of it applies to welding. Why am I interested in welding? Because I'm sort of a dilettante, I like to work on lots of different things, and welding allows me to do it. Okay, I can, I can tell you how fluorescent light works. I will tell you how fluorescent light works um, later on in the course. And you might say, what's that got to do with welding? It doesn't have any, that much to do with welding, but it helps you understand the physics of an electric arc, of which um, electric arc is, uh, is a part of welding. Another reason is it's important. Okay, it has improved what we make. Well, what, do, what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you a picture. A few years ago, I was dealing with some. Where'd they go? Uh, I was dealing with some uh, problems with the gas company here in Boston, and I had to go down to their training facility. And there in the training facility, they had some pictures of things they dug up out of the Boston streets that had been there for years and years. Uh, these were not carrying gas anymore, fortunately. Um, but you can pass around some of the pictures. Um, these are cast iron pipes. And basically they have a, a sleeve that fits over a pipe. And then they used to pack it with oakum, which is basically kind of a, a rope and limestone and mess and oil. And so it just kind of, you can see the oakum in these, in these joints. Uh, and these are things that... That's the way they used to distribute gas to heat your homes and light the lights in the city of Boston and other cities. They also had, although I didn't, can't find my picture of it, they had a picture of what they used before that to distribute gas to the streetlights in Boston. And they were basically wood logs that had been gun drilled. Anybody know what a gun drill is? A gun drill is called a gun drill because they used, used it drill big long gun barrels and basically a gun drill is you have a drill that rotates this way but your workpiece rotates the other way and the advantage of that is to the if the workpiece is stationary and you ever had to drill a long pole even a nice lathe it'll start turning and the drill will bend because it's so long and slender right even if it's a big fat drill if it's long enough you got a slenderness ratio and the, the drill will bend and it won't on the, you won't get a nice straight uh, drill hole down the thing. So they used to gun drill, they'd take a big log and they'd spin it one direction and they'd put a, a drill and they'd drill it the other direction and they'd have a, a one or two inch hole in a ten inch log and they'd bury the logs in the street and then they'd you know, open them up at the joints and they'd pass gas down through there. Great, huh? Until the joints fail or the log rots. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's this oakum? Oakum is kind of a mixture of Hemp, rope, and oil, and limestone, and other stuff. It's just kind of a, it's a gunk that you, white gunk with, it's kind of a composite. Today you call it composite if you sell it for a profit, right? But back in the old days, it was kind of what white collecting the sweepings on the floor with a little oil and other stuff to make it stick together, okay? Um, 
It's actually also how they, for you, the Navy, it's how they used to seal the uh, joints between the wooden ships, right? Still use oakum? What is oakum today? I mean, I'm sure it has a more specific composition than it did 100 years ago. Anybody know specifically? I think it's, it's basically quinoa. oil. Quinoa oil, but it's got some limestone filler in most cases. Maybe not today, but it's basically just just a, an oily rope you stick in there. There's, a, there's actually interesting technology all along history. Uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the archaeologists here asked me if I could come over early in the morning and look at these long brass, they're about two inch in diameter, 36 inch long bars. It turns out these came from the USS Constitution. This is a big question. Okay. These came from the USS Constitution. And it turns out Paul Revere had made these. And Paul Revere had gone over to Britain and learned the British secret of how to make these long Basically, they were ribbons. They were pins. You know, the USS Constitution is made with big, thick wooden beams, right? And that's why it's old iron sides. The, the balls would bounce off because it's good, strong wooden beams. And wood has got a little give and flexible, and right? So, how do you hold that together? Well, one of the ways to hold it together, back in the old days, they'd have a drill, a little hand drill, and you could drill a two-inch hole, 36 inches deep, in the shipyard. But then you had to put a pin in there. Well, now, okay, that doesn't sound so hard. You just drive it in with a mallet. As long as the pin is straight and round. But if the pin's not straight, can you imagine the friction that you have trying to drive this pin 36 inches deep in a two-inch hole if the, if the pin has got his, uh, a sine wave in it? Or if it's not perfectly round? The hole's round, but if the pin's not round, it's got to fit tightly. Nowadays, you can buy these things, you know, the rolling mills and stuff we have, you can buy a, a rod and it's, you know, it's diameter, it's round and its diameter is accurate and it's within the thousandths of an inch and everything. Well, back then, they didn't have great big rolling mills. And the question was, how did the British do it? How did Paul Revere do it? Because Paul Revere never told anybody. He learned the secret. He used it as a competitive advantage. He was the sole supplier to the U.S. Navy for making these pins, right? So that's how he got to be rich and famous. Um, in any case, uh, by looking at the cross section, just the outer layer, very thin outer layer, was heavily deformed. And the rest of the structure of the, of the brass was not. And I still don't know, but I think they had some flat plates. I don't know how they got flat, plates flat, but there's various ways you can do it. And basically it's kind of like kneading dough and rolling it back and forth. That's how you make a very round ball bearing today. You said you go in a circular motion between two flat plates. I believe they basically had flat plates and they were going in a linear motion back and forth. So they would forge these rods that had waves and out of round in them and then they would roll them back and forth and work the surface down to make them just the right size, straight and round, okay? At least that was my supposition. But no one knows. I mean, we lose technology. Um, uh, remember, what was the, was it the Missouri? Which was the uh, battleship down in Puerto Rico that had the, had the explosion on the, in the magazine of Iowa? You know, they never completely repaired that, that uh, damage. One of the reasons they didn't is we, do, we no longer know how to weld 14-inch thick armor plate. It's not particularly useful technology in most cases to weld 14-inch armor plate. But they used to do it all the time in World War II and before. But we don't know how to do it today without, without it cracking. Okay? So they didn't completely repair it. But there's only so many need, so there's only so many times you need a 16-inch gun anyway. Um, maybe nowadays, cruise missiles do just fine. Um, okay, so it's improved what we can make. It's increased the size. Of what we can make. Can you imagine welding, or can you imagine riveting a 14-inch thick vessel together, or an 8-inch thick uh, uh, nuclear reactor vessel, or a 4-inch thick uh, coal-fired generating station? How are you going to make that vessel? I mean, the vessel could be 10 times the size of this room, and it can have 4-inch thick walls. How are you going to join it unless you have uh, some sort of welding technology? It's also reduced the cost. 
In spite of the fact that welding and joining is typically a relatively high fraction of the manufacturing cost, it still has reduced the cost compared to what we used to make. Um, I can remember uh, working on a pen stock. Um, actually, I've worked on a couple of pen stocks in California and, and Maine, both. Anybody know what a pen stock is? You know what hydroelectric power is? Right? So you have water up on a mountain, and you want to bring it down the mountain to go through a, a generator. Well, that pipe that comes down the mountain is called a pen stock. I don't know why, but that's what they call it in the business. So it's a big pipe that comes down the side of the mountain. The <coughs> pen stocks that were put in in Maine 100 years ago, many of them are still in operation. And they were made by forging, they didn't have big rolling mills back in 18, actually, some of these are 1880, forging sheets, hot forging them into circles, and riveting them together. The problem is, after 120 years on the mountain, some of them are starting to rust. And the question is, how much longer can you use it? Because if I got a thousand foot head of water, how much pressure is that? 0.44 times a thousand. Anybody got it? <coughs> Get your calculators out. 440 psi. Uh, just, no divers in here, huh? Um, 0.44 psi per foot of depth of water. Um, and if you have 440 psi, that's a lot of pressure in a pipe and can cause some, some serious problems. To give you an idea of the fraction of a cost, if I'm making a large structure, typically a large structure may, the material cost, as a percentage of the cost of the structure, anybody have an idea of how much the material costs, the steel or the aluminum or building an aircraft? Yeah. Is it about 30%? 30% uh, is the max. If you're building a pipeline, it'll be 30%, but a more typical number is 10 to 20. Uh, if you're building um, an oil pipeline somewhere, then just buying the pipe will be about 30% of the cost of the pipeline. More typical numbers are 10% of the cost. Okay, we're going to go through this later. The welding and the joining are going to cost you 10 to 20%. Okay? The other fabrication, what's other fabrication? Well, other fabrication is you have to roll it, form it, machine it, make flanges, whatever. It's going to be 10 to 20%. If it's a high quality structure, a critical structure, you're going to spend 10 to 20% on non destructive evaluation ultrasonics, x-rays, whatever. You're going to have a GNA. What's GNA? Come on, somebody's working in the industry. GNA? General and Administrative. It's the overhead. You know, you ever heard of overhead? That's uh, 20 to 30 percent. Now, the GNA can include the engineering, the design, and stuff. And the profit, if you add all this up, is anywhere from plus 10% to minus 20%. You can lose money in these jobs. Um, but the point of this is welding is equal to the cost of the material, it's equal to the other fabrication, it's equal to the non destructive testing. They're all roughly equal in a typical structure. Um, it depends on what you're building. If you're building a space shuttle, well, you're going to find G and A and NDE are going to be bigger fractions. If you're building uh, a pipeline, this will be 30%. Um, if you're building a ship in a shipyard, a fairly complex, a lot of welding structure, or you're building uh, an earth mover, a caterpillar, uh, caterpillar is the largest user of welding consumables in the country. They use more pounds of welding electrodes than anybody else. Turns out, welding is a big cost. Uh, a typical shipyard that has 5,000 employees may have 2,000 welders. Now the welders may include fitters and some others, but, but basically um, a substantial fraction of your, your overall costs are going to be in welding. Um, there's also improved reliability in life. By 
the way, if, uh, on the handout, this stuff is all on the handouts, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, on one of the outlines. Improve reliability in life. Um, old riveted structures, although we've got a lot of old, old ones around, would don't have to, will probably not last as long because of all the crevices and corrosion uh, compared to uh, other structures. So those are some of the reasons why welding is important. Another reason, it's ubiquitous. What's ubiquitous mean? Everywhere, right? And I always ask, think of the largest standalone manufactured product that doesn't include a joint. See if you can do better than I say standalone. I mean, the largest metal object we make is a generator rotor forging. Starts as a 700 ton casting steel, gets forged, gets machined down, and maybe 350 tons when it's all done. So you've got a, what we call the Air Force calls the buy to fly ratio of two to one in that product. You buy two pounds of metal for every pound you put in service. But that's not a standalone product because it's just a big paperweight by itself until you put all the windings and put it inside a stator and make a generator out of it. So what's the largest thing you can think of? Some people say a needle or a nail. A railroad rail. A railroad rail? Uh, yep, okay. That's a good size. However, the railroad rail, if you're going to have a very long railroad, longer than the car, you have joints, right? You're talking about one piece, so it's not really, I mean, it can stand alone, but it's sort of a paperweight until you join it to the other things. And they join it by either bolting it, in which case you have stresses at the edges when the car goes by, the double and triple, and so you get heavy wear, and if you go and take real rail cars down in New Orleans, they have these little half inch dips because they bolted them together. And the thing goes ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. Okay, down as you're traveling along. And you can't go very far, and you tend to get key cracks and derailments and things like that. So now they weld them, and maybe later we'll talk about how to weld railroad rail. Uh, but that does have the, the big long tracks will have joints. Okay? Cast iron frying pan. That's what Stu came up with that once. Cast iron frying pan. You have to say cast iron because if it's an aluminum frying pan, it's probably got a plastic handle and there's a joint there, right? So one of the things to think about, if it's monolithic, it's got to be made out of one material. If you ever have more than one material for your product, you've got to have a joint, right? Um, you know, I've had lots of people come, uh, a shower stall, you know, it's a fabricated composite shower stall. Well, that's fine as long as you don't want to turn the water on and have a joint there where it comes through where it's going to leak. Which brings up another interesting point is, in general, um, joints contain many failures. In fact, Professor Blue, who's retired from this department, especially was fractured, and he used to say, something won't fail unless it's been welded. Okay? The first time I heard that, for the first 30 seconds, I thought, what's he telling the students? And then the second 30 seconds, I thought, uh, as long as they keep failing, I got a job. Okay? So, and that was 20 some years ago that I first heard that from him. Now, Professor Russell heard that and he says, or cast. Okay? So if something's cast, it will also fail. In 1992, I had to give the Houdremont lecture before the International Institute of Welding up in Montreal, and I had 500 of the world's welding experts, and I put up an overhead from, it says, Reggie Blue, something won't fail unless it's been welded. And there was dead silence for the first 10 or 15 seconds. <laughs> it just kind of sank in. And, it's, you know, and then all of a sudden, a little laughter went through the room. Um, but nonetheless, Typically, things do fail at joints. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the joint is usually located at the most highly stressed location. Where's the joint? It's usually at the corners, right? Corners are stress concentration. So you can't, even if the weld is just as good as the base material, it's still going to fail at the weld. And I often see people say, oh, it was a defective weld. It failed at the weld. And you look at it, and you see it's completely buckled. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that weld. It failed there because it was overloaded. 
the structure was overloaded. If you had a if you had a machine out of a solid chunk of metal, it still would have failed at that location. You can't blame it on the weld uh, necessarily. But in addition, the second reason, um, so one is highly stressed locations. In the structure, and the second is the joint is often not as strong as the base metal or base material, whatever it is, and that's that's always almost always true in heat treated aluminum alloys. You go through all kinds of fancy processing to get high strength in the aluminum, and then you do fusion welding and you wipe it out. Okay? Uh, that's becoming more and more the norm in some of the higher strength steels. Uh, we do all kinds of fancy processing to get fine grain size and high strength, and we go along and add heat to the whole thing and wipe all that out, and so the joint is not as strong. And there's all kinds of consequences of that. Well, that's enough for today. We will try to stop reasonably close to 8.20. This is reasonably close to a couple minutes over.